Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hopefully you can all hear me, but let me know if you can't. Um, my name is Maddie, and I will be your host today. I'm delighted to have this audience to discuss licensing. It's such an important topic to guarantee the resilience of our industry. So in the audience today, we have a, a real mix of people. We have content creators and producers. We have commissioners funders and some academics as well. So I'm very hopeful that this event is going to lead to a really good discussion. But um, before we kick off, I just want to tell you a bit of background and history about the show and tell events. So Digital Catapult has been running for the past few years, a program of support for the audience of the future winners. And one of the goals of this program is to facilitate co-working and shared learning amongst the different projects. And last year in March, it was during the second lockdown that we decided to try out this new format called the show and tell. And this was to include a wider audience of award winners from Audience of the Future, as well as the creative clusters. And this was to encourage wider networking, with, uh, which was especially important during this time of isolation. And the show and tell events are formatted around different topics that are relevant to the immersive industry, such as inclusive design, digital humans, immersive audio. And this, sixth, this is the sixth one, and it's um, about licensing. So the events are structured in such a way that they create a forum for sharing learnings and discussing and challenging assumptions around these topics. And many times they are community curated. So when you signed up, you will have seen that you can propose a topic um, and request to speak in a future show and tell. Um, for the first time, however, we have decided to use this as a research tool. So I'm now going to introduce you to my colleagues who will tell you a bit more about this research. So this is me. I'm Maddie. I'm the innovation partner at Digital Catapult, and I focus on immersive and creative programs. I'm now going to hand over to Aki. Hello, uh, my name is Aki. I work as a technologist and researcher at the tech, immersive tech team at the Catapult. And uh, Aki, do you want to say a bit about your the research? Yes. So uh, in the Audience of the Future program, on behalf of UKRI, we have in the past contacted two uh, research projects that I have been leading. And at the moment, we are working on another project which um, links to today's topic. So we are looking at mapping an overview of the immersive content life cycle. And obviously then distribution and licensing are part of that life cycle. But also next week at the same time, we will have another show and tell on archiving. So a uh, slightly different uh, part in the immersive content life cycle, but that's also something that we want to produce like an overview of and, and outline the challenges having to do with all of these topics and, and, and try to summarize what is the state of the industry today. So um, back to you, Maddie. Thanks, Aki. And Alice is also here today, who is co-hosting with me. Alice, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alice. So I'm an intern at Digital Catapult in the artificial intelligence and the immersive teams. So I'm um, on my gap year right now between school and uni, and I've been helping out with the research as well. Thanks, Alex. So I'm just gonna go through the agenda very quickly. We have a very straightforward agenda. We'll hear these two fantastic 10 minute presentations from Alex and Danielle. Um, and I'll let you introduce themselves. Um, I'll let them, sorry, introduce themselves. Um, but I can tell you that both of them have worked really hard on trying to make sense of this complex topic in just 10 minutes. So we're really in for a treat today. And after the presentations, we're going to have a Q&A and a discussion that, as Aki said, is going to feed into the research projects. So we're almost there. I just want to jump into a few, uh, tell you about a few housekeeping points. Um, so as a reminder, we're recording this event and it may be published 
on the Audience of the Future live site. So do please refrain from sharing any sensitive information. And don't forget to introduce yourself when you um, ask a question. Um, and one of us will remind you if you forget to. Um, use the raise hand function on Zoom at the bottom right under reactions. And one of us will call on you. Um, if possible, we would love for you to turn on your camera and microphone during the event. But we do understand that it's not possible for everyone. So don't let that stop you from still contributing and use the chat box if you prefer. Also, if you want to see captions, you can click on live transcript at the bottom and then view captions or view subtitles, I think. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to our presenters. We're going to start with Alex. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Maddie. Morning, everyone. I'm just going to share her away here. Great. Can everyone see that okay? Fantastic. Right, well, hi, hi everyone. My name is uh, Alex Winterbotham and I am an independent producer um, of immersive content. That can mean location-based experiences. It can mean VR, augmented reality, all kinds of fun, immersive stuff. Um, I recently produced uh, Immersive Arcade uh, with Digital Catapult, which was funded by UKRI. And for those of you that don't know it, it was a year long project to bring to life and provide access to some of the greatest uh, VR and 360 works that have come from British creators from the last 20 years. So um, today I've been asked to speak to you about licensing or licensing other people's IP, which is essentially what we did in this project. Um, and I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep it relatively high level, um, but really ask the question, how do you go about doing this, this, this task, this immensely kind of trust-based activity of approaching independent studios. Some of these are on the slide you can see at the moment, from Rewind to the BBC to Megaverse, some incredible companies we work with. How do you go about actually getting hold of their IP and um, repurposing it, I guess, or restaging it within a new context? Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But I want to begin just by having a little mini kind of vote. So um, if you look at the reaction function at the bottom of Zoom, you can, you can uh, find the raise hand feature there. And I'd be really interested to know just quickly how many of you have um, actively played a role in licensing someone else's IP, so third party IP before. So just if you can use the raise hand function now. So a couple of people, that's interesting. Okay, great. And how about those of you who have um, actively played a role in having your own IP license? So someone such as me, a producer or third party coming to you and saying, we want to license your IP. Show of hands. Okay, interesting. So I think this is an area that, um, and perhaps this is why I've been asked to talk about this, that we can do better as an industry. We have amazing cr creators, producers, directors. We output some of the best kind of creative work in probably in the world in this uh, industry. And yet we're often not very good at leveraging it for wider commercial gain or getting it to, let's say, tour internationally. So um, hopefully we can, we can touch on some, some of the... Um, both sides really of the commissioning or licensing process. I'm going to be approaching this mainly from the perspective of what I did in Immersive Arcade, which was reaching out to IP holders, but hopefully this will cast some light on what it's like to be approached and what that, what that negotiation might or could look like. So um, I'm just going to break this down into challenges and then how we, how we dealt with some of the, the challenges, a bit of a kind of immersive licensing checklist. I guess the first challenge that we found when licensing lots of content is that immersive is a uselessly kind of vague term. It's really, really broad. And we've got all of these highly jargonistic words like six dov, which people constantly talk about and which causes all, all kinds of controversy. So when you're going about licensing, um, it's, it's often a really, really hard starting point to know, you know, what is the thing you're actually trying to license? Um, is it part of a bigger experience? Is it 
maybe let's say a VR component within a wider museum based um, exhibition. Um, all of these words can can be really problematic and so clarity from the outset can be really, really important. I guess the second challenge that we've we've got when licensing content or that our team found when licensing content for immersive arcades is that we really, really don't have any accepted industry standards like standardization in this in this world. Um, a lot of companies who own IP haven't dealt with this process before. There's very little data around on what perhaps titles should be worth or benchmarking. And we've also got this problem of rapidly evolving technology as well, which means that a product or a piece of VR, let's say, that could have been very, very much at the front of its game five years ago now has a very different kind of financial implication for a license. The third challenge um, is that I guess when you're staging any kind of immersive work, um, no, no two plays are the same. And by that, I mean, this is so, so different to Netflix licensing a film from Universal Studios where it's one hermetically sealed finished file that never really changes. It's just the territories that might change in a license. In immersive, there's gonna be such a big element of trust in when, in when you license someone else's content. How are you gonna display it? Are you gonna stage it properly? Are you gonna think about you know, up-to-date headsets, lighting, all of these factors can play a huge role in, um, in delivering a, a good experience for, for an audience and ensuring that the creator, the original creator is happy with what you've done, with how you've, with how you've used that license, in other words. So trust is hugely, hugely important. And getting to that stage can be, can be of course, challenging. And all in all, it can make you want to do this. It can, it can be very frustrating. And I'm not going to lie, we, we uh, produced Immersive Arcade over the course of over 12 months. And licensing was, was always something that we knew would be quite, quite difficult. And uh, it would be hard to, to decide how much money to apportion to different projects. Um, and working with studios and bigger organizations to create or to re rework original titles was always going to be um, a real challenge in light of the licensing. So what do you do? Well, we came up with a, as a team, a immersive licensing checklist, which I'm going to keep really high level just because of how, how much time I've got today but just goes through some of the main things that, that we were looking to do in the process of licensing. And again, like I say, this might cast some light on um, how you might deal with this negotiation if you're being approached by a producer, let's say, such as me or an indie who wants to license your work for use in another environment. And so the first, um, the first item I've got in the checklist is come up with a really robust legal template with a media lawyer who really understands immersive content. And that media lawyer might have a background in television, but should certainly understand, or at least you should try to really elucidate what the differences are between um, you know, virtual reality and augmented reality, how a location experience might have different components, some of which are technological, some of which are live action based, for instance. So really, really coming up with a, with a robust template that you can trust, because it will be a back and forth, it will evolve over time, and it will, be, it will, it will also take a lot longer than you think to get to where you need to. Secondly, it can be incredibly, incredibly time consuming. Um, so I would just say roadmap that process as clearly as you can. So have three months, six months, 12 month delivery dates clearly mapped against where you need to be and set deadlines hard and fast because ultimately if your license not signed by a certain time, you are not going to have that, 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 that license when you need it. So on this slide here, I've got um, dream big. And I guess what I'm getting at here is how important it is to be really imaginative in how you draft your license, but also to be really honest. And what I mean by that is that the way you perceive, what the way that you think you're going to stage a piece of immersive work might be very different to the way the original creator intended it. So perhaps just to give an example, um, we worked with uh, Modigliani VR, 
on Immersive Arcade, which was originally a piece of VR that sat within a wider museum-based exhibition in the Tate Modern. And there are going to be so many implications to how a original VR work is staged five years later. And so the, the more honest you can be, the more upfront that you can be in the licensing process about what that, that journey might look like, about the changes you think you might need to make, the more likely you are to have a really productive discussion and a good license uh, conversation. And I think it's really important as well to be trusting our gut because we work with 12 different companies across the immersive arcade process. Um, and sometimes you have very uh, complex ownership structures in there. And so it's so important to build a creative relationship as early as possible. What's that first response you get from the IP holder? Is it, are they looking to work with you or are they looking to work against you? Is this about money or is this about genuinely trying to evolve or work hand in hand with you? Are they gonna be collaborative or are they gonna take this as a sort of sense of perhaps a threat to their original IP? Fair enough if that's how they choose to respond, but ultimately in big collaborative projects like this, you're gonna to need to work together and things might change and things might go wrong. And so the sooner you can ascertain how you're gonna to work together and whether it's gonna be productive, the better. So just a bit of a checklist recap there of what some of the points I've been through. Utilitarian license template with a lawyer you really trust. Um, roadmap that licensing schedule really clearly. Do not underestimate resourcing and how long that this process will take you. Um, the importance of building a workable creative relationship with everyone involved in the licensing, especially if it's a complex ownership structure. And finally, when you come to agree that license, just really be imaginative about it. What might happen? What might need to change? What could go wrong? Um, and those hopefully just give you some senses of some of the processes we went through to be able to license amazing titles like Home from uh, Rewind, uh, Nothing to be Written and Medigliani, which I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Final thing, please spell license correctly. It's, it's just really annoying when it, when it isn't. So that's just something that our, our, our legal team got annoyed about. And uh, I know I got a bit annoyed about occasionally, but um, it uh, it's, sets a good precedent when that's, when that's correct. Over to Danielle. Hello. So yes, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and pick up where where <clears throat> Alex led off. Um, so Alex, he, he laid out so, very clearly some of the, the major challenges with which this industry faces. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me fine. Uh, good. So <clears throat> yes, uh, and especially from the perspective of the licensee, uh, and it's true from vocabulary to technology, there's there's really no denying that there's a major factorization and decentralization that poses uh, some challenges when trying to build a sustainable market. And, and so that's exactly what the Atlas V team uh, was seeing in 2019, going to festivals around the world. Um, it was one of the founders, Antoine Carroll, uh, who was really struck by the fact that, that there's so much excellent content, but then where does it go? Um, and so just, just so you know, Atlas V is a, an immersive production studio in France. And Australia is the third branch that was recently uh, created. Um, and the what they saw uh, before pandemic um, was what, what are the next steps of, of this content? Um, and so that was the early seeds for what become this third branch. Um, and my name, just so you know, is Danielle, and I was the first uh, team member brought on to Australia. And so from the very beginning, I've been working side by side with, with uh, the team to, to start to tackle some of these issues and answer that question of what is next. Um, so a little bit more background about Australia. Uh, what, what, what are, who are we? What do we do? Well, we are one of the first immersive publishers and distributors of um, immersive narrative content. And so we currently have a catalog of over 50 projects uh, that, that range in format. So six stuff, as Alex said, that can be a loaded term, but uh, fully immersive or 360. And we also have some AR pieces and digital art as well. 
and uh, dome versions too. Uh, so springboarding off of some of the challenges and solutions that Alex lays out for, for the producer that wishes to license on their own, uh, that's, that's kind of what Estrella is trying to do. Uh, we're a team of passionate VR enthusiasts who are working hard to be that missing link between producers that are stuck between the burnout of working out uh, working on a project and the desire to see that project live longer than just the festival run. Um, so we're trying to establish a distribution pipeline to fill the gap and give a longer lifespan. So as Alex focused more on the perspective of the licensor, I'll share more of the perspective of the distributor, because that's uh, more of what I know. And so just, just so you, as I said, I have we have uh, over 50 projects right now from obviously Atlas V's projects are here, but we have 3DAR, Space. we have some projects that are collaborative by B BBC, Google Arts and Culture, NSC Creative. Habitat XR. So we're really excited to work with some of uh, uh, the most amazing producers um, and a variety of, of virtual reality pieces, uh, as I said, from uh, totally different formats and <clears throat> mixing genres. So we have documentary animation, interactive and passive. And so immersive. This was, uh, it's important to first understand that it's true. This is an umbrella term, uh, or as Alex said, it can be uselessly vague. Uh, and so what, what do we mean when we say that? Uh, vocabulary is important because each different type of immersive content needs to have a different approach. And so instead of trying to fit everything under the same umbrella, it's important to divide and understand that there might be overlap, but this doesn't mean that, that each content should be treated the same. And so I would like to just take a little bit of time to, to break down how we see uh, the, the industry in this moment. So distribution as the umbrella term that I'm using right now uh, can kind of be broken into two different fields. So we have digital publishing and physical exhibitioning. Um, and so on the and between the link between both of those is obviously localization. So just as a general statement, getting getting your project into as many different languages as possible, depending on your funding for that, is, is going to make it more accessible to more people. Um, so that's why they're both connected. But if we look at digital publishing, that can also be broken into those two different formats. So on the six stuff side, there's a further factorization of, of how uh, these different formats should be treated. So there's standalone VR, obviously Quest, uh, Pico, PSVR headsets that don't require a PC. And then there's PC VR uh, pieces that uh, would require that computer. Um, and so each can have a different approach. And uh, in terms of digital publishing, there's the, the platforms that I list right there are, are uh, ways that users at home can access this content. And then on the 360 side, there are avenues at this moment for, for licensing and for uh, revenue um, to come in. And that can be through video streaming platforms such as Oculus TV and uh, telecom licensing. So that is a digital streaming through broadcasters that might be interested in 360 content. Um, some of our projects that you saw before in our catalog are available, for instance, uh, through telecom licensing, such as Alteration or iPhilippe. Um, and then on the physical side, we have festivals. Uh, obviously, that's one of the first places that we think about, because this is a great way to get the content out there into, uh, into physical spaces and um, also to, to get rev to get buzz and attention on the project and really to share in that community. Um, and that I include in festivals, pop-up ticketed events. Uh, and then there's LBE, so location-based entertainment. Um, so that can be for, for both 6 and 360. Uh, and I list Wonder Spaces and VR World as two examples, but there are quite a few. Um, that are interested in narrative content, not just gaming. And lastly, what I consider the third part of the branch is cultural spaces. So that can be museums um, or historical sites that might be interested to, to start VR to go. Uh, so that's something that the Centre Fee is doing in Canada and Bozar is doing, uh, and as well as the Portland Art Museum in the US. So renting out headsets with content so you can license that way. Um, and then we also see it as broken down in to uh, two other ways. So VR2Go is one, 
exhibition enhancement. So they might have some sort of curatorial lineup that could benefit from immersive content. So that would be a way of enhancing the exhibition that already exists. And then immersive installations, uh, which can be done either through sponsorship or specific commission from a, a location. So that's kind of how this, those two branches can be broken up with localization as uh, one of the, the main connecting factors. Um, so moving on to the next, digital publishing. I want to talk about that first. Uh, so the question is, is there a future for this? So what we see is that the numbers are quite promising. There's no big boom that was maybe talked about in 2015 where everyone would be uh, in their headsets all the time. However, there is interest in, in uh, content that is story-based and narrative. So this is from, this is a report from Oculus uh, regarding their user base that gives us some insights about the future. Um, this data is obviously very US focused, but we see that the top countries uh, in more research uh, for Oculus Quest are the US and the UK. So if you're considering digital publishing as a viable option for your project, then there might be some things that you would want to consider. So first of all, uh, I'll, and I'll get more into detail about this, but uh, we can talk about formats. So I said before, there's VR standalone, there's PC VR, there's 360. What we try to do uh, with, with our producers um, and what Atlas has always done is uh, to format your project into as many different versions as possible. So it's much easier to go if you, again, if you have the funding to go from a standalone VR piece to uh, PC VR and then 360. So artistic standards are very important, and but we also find that the most accessible and affordable headsets are this, the, the standalone or headsets that accept 360 video. And so if you're thinking about even for physical exhibiting, uh, you want to think carefully about going straight to PC VR because that can pose the, the most amount of hurdles um, and 360 can really open up um, for different different avenues of distribution. Uh, the next that I will talk about is <clears throat> understanding and adopting video game industry practices. So um, we want to talk about interactivity and and if you can early on in the process of production think about how it can be rewatchable so what makes the project special in order to to bring people back to the same project if that's something that you're considering and then um yeah that that is also connected to to adding and understanding the the video game industry so being able to communicate and talk to uh, people at home who might be interested in this type of content. So if we talk about an example, Madrid Noir, uh, which was a project that was uh, supported also by Creative XR and Digital Catapult. Um, and Madrid Noir is a project that uh, it's an interactive immersive story uh, broken up into two episodes totaling about 40, 44 minutes. So the story is meant for wider audiences, um, but it does touch on some more serious topics. So it kind of has that um, Pixar film inspiration. Uh, and so it's it's a story about a young woman revisiting her past and covering a mystery. And as I said, it's it's interactive. Um, and so originally the project was made for Oculus Quest. Um, and we were lucky also to be able to work with uh, Quest as, as a supporter. So um, we had an exclusivity period of three uh, three months on that platform. So that's when it was published. And then preparing for uh, the PC VR, we were able to publish on the Steam platform in November. And then uh, right now we are currently working on exporting to, uh, to a 360 version. So then that's a project that, that would, given that it's 360 accessible, we could watch it, uh, we could work with telecom or we can um, license in other ways. So by formatting it in all these different ways, you can really touch as many people as possible. Um, so this, this goes on to talk about the industry practices of video games and trying to understand them. Um, so visibility on these store platforms are really based on how the video game sales work. So understanding that and trying to, to communicate in the right way 
by doing either paid video ads, we can see that there is a real, sorry, my cat, uh, there is a real impact on the, the sales figures, on the, the people who are coming to uh, investigate first on the store page and then to, to add it to their library. Um, so that is pretty, pretty exciting to see. Uh, and then channels of communication. So we always think of, um, Instagram, Facebook as the as the major sources, but uh, where we find that that uh, people with headsets at home are is Discord and Reddit. So adding that to part of the the pipeline is important. And then really being responsive. Um, I I screenshotted a review. Not all the reviews are positive, by the way, but I did take a positive one um, because the 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 thing is there is a little bit of a disconnect between the video gamers and the people that are interested in this type of content. And so seeing what they are expecting and trying to meet them or at least respond to them uh, is important so that they can see that you are responsive and active. And then just if we can touch quickly on the idea of rewatchability, um, I wanted to, to bring up ayahuasca as an example. Um, so this project, it, its rewatchability is, is kind of um, wasn't exactly planned, but we can see the impacts of the fact that it can be rewatched in terms of the lifespan of the project uh, in digital publishing. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's a project that takes you on a trip based on ayahuasca drug. So it, it also kind of taps into that niche. Uh, there's people who like VR and who are interested in drug culture. So that's very specific. But something interesting about this is every time you watch it, it is slightly different. So it invites people to come back and it gives them some value worth to, to making the jump to adding it to their library. So now let's talk about physical exhibiting, the second branch of, of what how we divide it. So in-person exhibition is in some ways more tricky than online because online we can we can mo model some of the, the, the formats that already exist through through uh, video game industry. But um, with in-person, especially due to the pandemic, this, this can complicate things. Uh, and so this is a branch of Australia that we are currently expanding and working on um, so we, we currently work with most international uh, festivals that exhibit VR uh, and some of the largest uh, locations that showcase VR for entertainment and uh, cultural spaces. So we're lucky to have that, those connections and to be able to come today with some considerations on physical exhibiting side. So uh, I kind of broke it into three, three different points as well. The first being having a scalable model for your installation or exhibit. So in terms of when a project first is shown and a festival installation can be really uh, show-stopping and it's meant to make a splash but the, the, it's important to think about how you can take that uh, after the festival and propose it to other locations so it has to be something that is scalable um, and then the next point is it's really important to create a clear and concise tech writer with materials and costs so that can also uh, reduce some of the barriers with cultural institutions with locations uh, if they have very clear instructions and then versioning so who can afford what? So we'll talk about more about that by going into uh, an example. So the first is, oops, I'll go back. Uh, the first is, is an exhibit that we did, that we did this fall um, at the Gallery Peloton in Paris. And so I, I think I just showed that. We, showed, we had four projects, a uh, mix of interaction uh, and non-interactive projects. So there was Gloomy Eyes, Spheres, Notes on Blindness, and Battle Scar. And so these four are kind of seen as a best of theme of best of Atlas V. Um, and so how was it advantageous? It was really important for us to, to get the word out there about uh, the connection between uh, contemporary art and virtual reality. So that was that was a big goal that we had with this exhibition. Um, and from the beginning, we worked side by side with the venue. Uh, it was kind of seen as a proof of concept in order to then expand. Um, so they pro we provided the material, the training, the exhibition design, and the content and promotional materials. And they uh, brought the, the press release, the actual physical space, and the docents who managed the space. So just so you know, as you can see from, from here, this is 
kind of what the space looked like. It was very white, white label um, and minimalist, but we had 11 spots and three, uh, three guides. Um, and so we did find that there's interest in bringing and expanding this content to other locations. Uh, the ticket in Paris was 29 euros for, um, uh, and then a reduced price for students and those less than 26. And so uh, we didn't find that it brought a huge profit, uh, especially because there were materials that had to be bought and a lot of overhead. However, uh, for future exhibitions, it created, like I said, a proof of concept and there was very positive feedback from participants. So it's encouraging and um, we are planning to move forward with uh, the other locations that they have. Um, and this is another project, as I said, um, that required a very clear tech writer. So this is an, a digital art piece that's immersive and interactive. And this is an image of it shown at the Singapore Art Science Museum. It's called What is Left of Reality. So we found that having that very clear tech writer of how the installation can be set up is extremely important. Um, and lastly, the, the last thing on the list is versioning. Um, so physical exhibition licensing, it's really foggy right now because um, it's really about a conversation a negotiation meeting people where they're at and seeing how you can work together and having different versions of an exhibit exhibition can really uh be a way to to help ease those conversations so if you have a a gold standard and then you have a very uh as we saw before if i go back to to this image a very bare bones type of format then um, they can choose and see what works for them so uh, obviously contracts are very important um so if you're following the alex checklist that that can be a really great way to to make sure things are in order and um yeah, so that's, thank you for listening. That's, that's, uh, that's the most important things that we've found with licensing and uh, the distribution model that we're trying to build. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Danielle and Alex. That was amazing. So much information. Um, yes, so much information and uh, really, really helpful. I do have a question um, following up on both of your presentations. Um, and please, uh, the audience, please start preparing your questions as well while, um, while I ask this. But um, it's clear from your presentations that licensing is such a um, it's, it's a specialization in a way it requires sort of an, their own like in, in a team of producers, it would require somebody who really knows what they're doing and somebody who's spending a lot of time on this and sort of thinking about it from the very beginning of a project um, because it's just so much work um, and there's so many options and there has to be a proper strategy. So uh, my question is, who do you think is responsible for this in a team of creators? Does that currently exist? Is it, part, is it like the responsibility of the creator to do this? Um, so yeah, uh, that's my question for both of you. I could I could jump in. Um, well, it's hard for me to say exactly because that that was the reason why I was brought on in Atlas, and that's why they started this third branch because. Uh, I, uh, what the producers are finding is after years of working on the same project to then uh, once it's kind of has its festival run that's that's still just the beginning, you know, so you if you are um, the creator behind that, it might be good to, to look into reaching out to a distributor or bringing someone on to your team that can really start to tackle these, uh, these, these questions and these, um, these hurdles. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just add to that, the one thing I think that's really clear about licensing immersive works is it's not something that just lawyers can do between themselves. You know, it's it's got to involve the whole team. It's got to involve producers. It's got to involve technical people where producers don't have the technical know-how. Um, and it's got to be a really kind of, ideally a really organic process. Um, otherwise, it you just hit barriers really early on. So yeah, I think I think to your to your question, Maddie, if, if creators can, think strategically earlier on in the process about what their work is and how it might be divided up into different parts, some of which might potentially be externally licensed to various different bodies, then that will kind of potentially make a lot of projects a lot more, um, yeah, a lot, a lot more financially viable. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm, oh, I see that somebody has a question. It's Ian. Ian, sorry. Do you mind if I ask another question? <laughs> um, okay. I'm just, I'm just curious to hear, like, there's somebody in the audience who I know um, has licensed, or maybe it's a different term, but who has um, sort of um, showed their piece of content for five years. Um, and I'm curious to know how much work it was for them um, and sort of what additional support would they have needed in order to do this? Um, so I know that this is A&E company. Do you guys mind talking about this? Yes, yeah, sure, we can try, but our um, uh, area got the Wi-Fi outrage and our connection might be not so great. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. So let's try, and then if anything, we'll yeah move on. Okay, great. Um, yeah, sure. We have been touring our show for the last five years since two thousand and seventeen. Um, and uh, all the IP. So we we are dance company. So we tour as an, um, a more traditional way of dance company touring, but ma making uh, having a leverage of touring digital content has been really, really great for us. That's why we could tour so much because it's a mobile touring. All the equipment are very, very light set up that we can tour. And then that's what the festival and venues like really. And the IP belongs to us all. And that's why it's it, it has been very good for us to organize all the touring uh, by ourselves. Yeah, we're looking and also so. Ah. I don't know if we are still online, to be honest. Yes, no, I heard you. Thank you. Thanks for explaining that. Um, yeah, I really um, I, I'm just curious to know, like what as producers and I see that Aneta, you're a producer and you're actually on the uh, you just turned off your video. So I'm going to call on you. Um, what? Like, what additional support would you need to um, to be able to license content as a producer? Um, do you need? Um, yes, I mean that's that's my key question. Actually, what additional support do you need? Sorry, we couldn't hear you. Yes, uh, I could. Yes, I can hear you, Annette. Aneta, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a, it's a question for me. Yes, it's for you. Um, what was the question? Sorry, I was listening to something. Oh, okay. So the question is, what additional support do you need in order to license content as a producer? Additional support do you need? Um, I think kind of, um, I, yeah, I mean, I had my own question as well, so I'll bring that up in a moment. But yeah, first of all, thanks to Danielle and Alex for your super informative presentations. I really enjoyed the content of both and also Maddie for hosting this. I'm really, really glad I joined this session this morning. Um, uh, I would echo a lot of what they both said in terms of thinking about the licensing almost from the very beginning. So thinking about how can you make this project rewatchable, um, borrowing from video game, you know, uh, methods, approaches to how, yeah, how, how they approach and how they design content to make sure that it keeps people wanting to come back. So, um, I most recently produced a project called Goliath at Anagram, and uh, it was very much a narrative piece, but we definitely borrowed from lots of different video gaming um, tools um, and uh, just to make sure that people could enjoy playing the piece. And each time they watched it, even though it was the same story, they had a slightly different experience. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers your question about what kind of support, but I think that's something to definitely think about when you first start making a project. Um, but I actually had a question which um, is quite specific, but it is something that Danielle touched on. So maybe one of you on this forum might be able to help. Um, so I'm currently producing at an immersive studio called ScanLab Projects. Um, and they produced a 360 film with the Don Ma warehouse. It's a three theatrical piece called Adult Children. Um, and it's been on the festival circuit. Um, we're thinking about putting it onto Oculus TV. And I was wondering if anybody knows whether there's a way to monetize 
content that goes on Oculus TV? Is there a way to um, add some kind of ticketing function? Or if not on Oculus TV, is there any other platform on Quest where you can do this? So upload your own, own content and have it be paid for? Um, open question in case anybody knows the answer. I can answer. <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah, you want to make sure you don't just publish it for free. Um, because there are ways to to monetize that not through like, uh, not through the, the user buying, um, but through licensing. So um, yeah, yeah. So we, we, for instance, all the projects that we have on Oculus TV, we worked with Oculus to bring them there for a duration normally of two years. So we'll have a contract with them. Um, and yeah, so that's, it's, but if you just put it for free, then it's kind of uh, already gone. <laughs> you know, it's hard to hard to go back and from there. Okay, and is that sorry? I, I can maybe drop you an email after, given that this is quite a specific question. But is that sort of like a back channel? Because obviously, there's Oculus Media, um, Oculus Media store or platform, and that sort of tells you you can publish content either unlisted or public but it doesn't mention anything about monetization so is that sort of like a back conversation you'd have with oculus um yeah i guess so it was, it's something we've just uh it's it's been part of our our, our connection pipeline is is to to work with them for because we also do work with them for as i said madrid noir the the six stuff version um and then and then other other projects as well so so that that helps um because there, as we see, there is more and more interest for this type of narrative content. So um, yeah, if that helps, but yeah, shoot me an email, um, that would be good. Cause I guess it is pretty. Thank you. And yeah, thanks everyone. Just to add to that, Annette, it's, it's something I think we learned across Immersive Arcade working with lots of different companies was the importance of thinking about exclusivity, exclusivity upfront and just really reading, you know, contracts carefully because suddenly you find that your project can't go on Vive port or, or what have you um, and that prevents that whole revenue stream from coming in so just devils in the detail as ever yeah that's obviously really important um especially like in the uk as you know the kind of standard is that producers as any said as well they own their own ip they retain their own ip so they need to manage it properly um, and, you know, that's always that's also difficult. And also because, as Danielle mentioned, you have the connections with Oculus, um, but what if you don't, you know, so it's it's quite um, it's quite difficult. Um, and there is a question from Moira here in the chat saying that and I, it's a very valid question um, related to this. So in TV, there are established distributors who um, work with production companies um, and uh, in as soon as a program is commissioned so I guess yeah and as soon as it's commissioned so from the very beginning as we've been talking about um, is there a distributor like that in this market I mean Danielle maybe Australia is the closest one I don't know uh, what what do you think both of you or anyone else actually um, yeah, well, so that's, there are other distributors that, uh, especially on the, the LBE side of things, um, but in terms of publishing this type of content um, in Europe, we, we, we are seeing that, that there aren't that many um, yet. So, the, so there's uh, Australia, but then I know in, in France, for instance, there's a, a, a team diversion and then there's, there's Lucid Realities that are doing the more LBE side as well and location-based entertainment. Yeah, so it sounds like distributors that work with you as soon as a project is commissioned aren't very, aren't in the market yet. Maybe they will be at some point. Or yeah. it, it like, because I know that you guys produce content um, and that means you work with that content um, as soon as it's, you know, as soon as it's commissioned. But if it's not, com if it's not something that you guys are producing, then you might pick it up later on, but not as soon as it's commissioned. 
Well, for some projects, it is what we do find is if it makes sense to get involved early, it, it can be better. Because, for instance, yes, Mudra Noir was a project produced by Atlas, but it was kind of one of the first ones that we, we were there from the beginning. So, uh, and I think that that really helped us do this, this really specific influencer marketing campaign, and uh, which I, I didn't mention, but that was part of the release. Um, and uh you know all all of the the advertising and and um community engagement online so that that was good because we were there from the beginning great thank you so much danielle um and that's yeah that's really interesting so maybe these kind of distributors will pop up more and more uh, like yourselves you know obviously more are needed um and I just wanted to read this response from a, a, any company that they are a dance company and they followed more of the path of traditional theater when they worked on touring their project. Um, they um, kept their own IP and um, combined with the mobility that VR and digital work can offer to reduce the touring costs by minimizing people technical requirement from the venue and freight costs, they were able to continue and to continue to sort of license their piece and showcase it all over um, and for five years, which is quite impressive. Um, I see that there's a question from Emma. Hello, um, I'm Emma Cooper. I'm from Cooperative Innovations. We built a platform called Curators um, and I'm actively looking for um, factual content. So narrative, factual content, um, documentary would work. Um, we are at the very beginning of our journey. Alex's talk was super helpful um, in terms of licensing. I've been spelling it wrong for months, I've just realized. Um, and I just wanted to say, I'm really open to having a conversation <laughs> um, about the content that you have. We're not looking for exclusivity. Um, what we're looking to achieve is a groundswell of really awesome content so users know where to look. Um, ultimately, uh, we've had lots of conversations with the museum sector and so far in the museum sector, there's some individual people that have been doing really excellent work at this level but generally across the sector it's slow going so what i'm trying to do is look to our sector to see who's been working in this sector and kind kind of work with immersive producers um as like a, a middleman um we have the ability to um sell tickets so we we exist to create money for this market. I, I've worked as a producer and also as a curator at DocFest Alternate Realities and I know how hard this is. It's really hard to find audiences and it's hard to claw back the costs of the effort and the time and the love that's gone into this work. So I'm really interested in having conversations with people about getting more eyeballs on your brilliant work. That's great. Thanks, Emma. And yeah, really good forum to mention this as well. Um, it's great to hear that you're working on this. We're very much needed, obviously. Um, Ian, you have a question. I'm sorry for skipping you earlier. Please go. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. Um, it's, it's, it's totally fine. I, it, it kind of follows on, actually. I've got a couple of questions, but the first one, which kind of follows on from, from the last one, is actually around um, pricing. And I think one of the things that was interesting when we were trying to work through Immersive Arcade was it really wasn't clear to us initially, especially, how do what value do... Uh, do we put on um, the license for immersive uh, experiences that we were trying to bring into it? And also what value should the licensors be putting onto it so it's kind of an open question um i guess to the group like how do you how do you how do you approach that how do you work out what the fair price for a given piece of content is and is there any advice you can give us on that i have two things one is this is a place where i think games got it wrong i think free to play ruined everything 
um, and that we need to value ourselves much more highly than that. Um, I think that we're looking at really flexible pricing. So some stuff will be for free, some stuff will be um, moderately priced, and then we'll go for premium exclusive content that um, only certain people will be able to get access to, and that will be highly priced. And I think having a really broad approach to pricing is wise, um, but having a good understanding of what you've spent on something and then trying to claw that back per person, per like ex genuinely expected person that's going to interact with it in the future, it's hard though. Yes, it's hard indeed. Um, I'm curious to know from producers in the group, I see that oh, we're almost out of time. Um, so in the UK, um, a lot of the content is, um, is financed, I guess, or funded by uh, UK government initiatives or public uh, funds. Um, so Madrid Noir was partly funded by Creative XR, for example. Um, and the creators tend to keep the IP. Um, whereas in Canada, um, I'm aware that the NFB has a model um, where they fund the content, they, um, uh, they pay the directors and the creators, but they keep the IP um, and they're responsible for licensing the content. So I'm curious to know generally from um, content commissioners, uh, et cetera, um, what do you think of this Canadian model? Um, and do you think that could work for the UK? Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Um, Alex. I just, um, it's, it's a really good question, Maddie. And I just, I wonder if, um, especially when we're talking about different models that, that exist within, within immersive, rather than thinking about any one model, like for instance, thinking in terms purely of a distributor, we should kind of think more broadly about how we can create projects where the distributor, let's say, might be a venue, it might be a stadium, it could be a brand that ends up disseminating your content. And so just thinking much more, I don't know, creatively about how our work can, can get out there, I think can be, can be really useful. Um, yeah, because it's just, it's just so fragmented, isn't it, at the moment, the ecosystem, and um, I think that's just very problematic for all sorts of indies who've got great projects but don't perhaps know how to, how to monetize them. But I think just coming back to thinking about immersive, like any product that you would sell, how much does it cost to make? How much will someone pay for a ticket? You know, develop an MVP, a little, a little pilot, and then how many people can you push through? Um, it's a lot of it. I think is there's there's some sort of simple kind of common business, good good business sense missing from from the equation. Great, thank you so much, um, Alex. I'm just. Uh, does anyone have any final thoughts that they want to share in the last minute? Um, Great, thank you so much for this amazing session to everyone who contributed. Um, Emma wrote her email as well in the chat, so please do save that if you'd like to catch up with her. Um, hopefully you all found this useful and thank you so much for your contribution. Um, there's another show and tell on archiving immersive content. Aki, do you mind just, I know you mentioned it in the beginning of the session, but for those who missed it, can you just mention what it's about? Yes, so so obviously we talked about the longevity of uh, content, and even if this might sound like a bit of a stretch, but eventually there will be immersive content that an institution out there would want to archive and even preserve and restore at some point for future audiences. But obviously that has quite a lot of technical challenges in itself. But it does tie into, for instance, those tech writers that are mentioned as kind of like an encapsulation and documentation of, for instance, an LBE project. But that, that's just an example of the different challenges that, that there are. And so next week, I will sort of summarize what, what is the state of uh, this field in the sense that what is relevant, for instance, from 
archiving and preserving media art installations from from the past before like VR and so on and so forth. And 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 then we have another speaker from the from the DNA uh, giving their sort of insights and and perspective to this this issue. And as I said, it's part of this whole content life cycle research that we're conducting. Yeah, so the show and tell event is uh, next uh, week, same time, same place. Um, I will send you um, a follow up email with the recording of this session, as well as um, a link to that show and tell uh, in case you're interested. It's a very another very <laughs> complex topic. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice Friday and weekend. <laughs>